Let's turn together in our Bibles to Revelation 12. Revelation 12. And we will be reading and studying together verses 1 through 6. Revelation 12, verses 1 through 6, where God's Word reads as follows. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when the When she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. So far the reading from God's word this morning. May he add its blessing to our hearts. Well, from chapter 4 to the end of chapter 11, we have worked our way through the seven seals. We have opened them all or have seen them opened. We have heard the thunders rumbling and we have heard the trumpets blown. And now when we come to chapter 12, we come to a new section in the book of Revelation. Uh, In preparation of this sermon series and In Revelation, uh, I did a rough outline of the book of Revelation myself. And as I did that, you can divide the book of Revelation really into seven basic sections. You have the general introduction in chapter 1. You have the letters to the seven churches in chapter 2 and 3. You have the section of the seven seals, chapters 4 through 11. And then this is the fourth section, which is a section that deals with the defeat of the powers of those who oppose the church. And it's kind of the background things. It's it's the things that are happening behind the scenes, so to speak. And that's where we're starting. We're looking at this section that deals with the defeat of the enemies of the church. But when we start this section, it doesn't necessarily look like the church is being victorious. It doesn't necessarily look like the church is in a position of great power. And so as we begin our section, what we want to see in these first six verses is that that even in the face of the heaviest persecution, that God preserves his church. So in the face of the heaviest persecution, God preserves his church. And what we want to do in our text today is we want to see some identities revealed. So there's some some characters that are being introduced and, and they will carry themselves through to through much of this section and, and even the rest of the book, really. So we're going to look at some identities. Then we're going to look at the malice of the dragon. And then we're going to look at the provision and protection of God. So in the face of the heaviest persecution, God preserves his church. We're going to see some identities revealed, the malice of the dragon, and the provision and protection of God. So let's begin by thinking about some of the identities that show up in verses 1 through 5. The first challenge, which is a a repeating challenge when you're working your way through the book of Revelation, the first challenge to this section is that we interpret it properly. And so to do that, it's important to understand what exactly we're dealing with in terms of these verses. And what we're dealing with is two signs. It's identified that way. Verse 1, a great sign appears. Verse 3, another sign appears in heaven. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is a sign? What's going on here? Do we read it as history? Uh, What's taking place in this text? And I think we know by now, uh, the book of Revelation is a prophecy, chapter 1 and verse 3, so we don't read it like a a history textbook. So so we read, uh, trying to understand these signs, well, what is a sign? A sign in Scripture is a, is a wonder, uh, an unusual event, and, and an unusual occurrence 
that is used to identify a future result or identify the, the, the office of the person who is performing the sign. In this case, uh, this sign is an identity that acts in some sense like a parable. Uh, the sign is uh, an overall picture that represents a group or that, rep- represents, a, a, that represents a, a person. Now, there's two dangers that can happen when you're looking at signs and and when you're reading something like a parable from the Bible. The first danger, of course, is that you over-allegorize the symbol. So what can happen is you look at all the different parts of this this first six verses and you want to give a meaning to everything. Everything has to have a meaning, including uh, the, the different horns and the different heads and the different diadems and, 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 and you over-allegorize. You, you, you try to make the sign say too much. The other, the other opposite danger, of course, is that you over-literalize the symbol. And, and so you start reading the symbol as if it is a historical narrative. And, and in those moments, the symbol doesn't say enough because you're robbing it of its theological significance. You're robbing it of the importance of why it's given in this text. The the prophet John gives this symbol for a reason. And so as we look at these two symbols, what we see represented in these symbols, and we'll look at them in turn, we see uh, the course of history in some sense in parable. The course of history as it's established at first in Genesis. In Genesis, of course, chapter 3, very dark period in human history where sin enters into the world. And when sin enters into the world, one of the first things that God does is He establishes the only two groups of people that exist in all the world. There is the seed of the woman and there is the seed of the serpent. And, And this text and these signs are kind of mapping a course of history of those two groups of people, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. So, so let's look first at the, at the first sign in verse 1, this great sign which appears in heaven. So John is uh, having an, a, a vision, and the vision is of a, of a singular subject in the first place. Uh, there is a woman clothed with a sun, with a moon under her feet, with a crown on her head with 12 stars, and she is, in, she is pregnant and in the process of giving birth. So it's a picture of a woman in labor. She is, she is an unusual woman, but she is not a generic woman. This woman as a symbol has an identity. And this is the most difficult a symbol to identify in these six verses. To identify, you look in the rest of Scripture. Scripture informs who the woman is. And so you have this picture of the woman and the church, the people of God. It's often represented as a woman. Uh, th- there are different places where you can turn. I just want to use one of them. I, I want to turn to the Song of Solomon not a book that we refer to very often, chapter 6 and verse 10. Now, today there's some confusion about how the Song of Solomon is to be read, or the Song of Songs, however you want to, whatever you want to call it, but in the time of the Reformation especially, and today also, the Song of Solomon was often read as an allegory of the relationship between Christ and His church. There was Christ the bride and the church the the woman, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, I got that mixed up, the, the, the groom, and, uh, Christ, and, and the woman, the church. And so in Song of Solomon 6 and verse 10, it says, this is the, the, the male in the allegory speaking, who is this who looks like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners. This is him describing his bride. This is him describing his his. Woman, this woman who is splendorous in majesty here in this text also with this being clothed in the sun, the moon under her feet, and the, and the, the head with a crown of, of 12 stars. This woman is the church. This woman is the people of God. And you can look in another place. 
uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, where there is the picture of uh, the husband and wife relationship. And, and, and we shouldn't only dwell on that in terms of a husband-wife relationship. We should recognize that within that husband-wife relationship, there is a picture. And in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 32, that picture is defined for us. When, when, we, when we work our way through a right establishment of the husband-wife relationship, it is actually a picture of Jesus' ministry to his church. And the church is the wife. The church is the woman. And so you have that here as well. This woman who is in labor, this woman who is in turmoil, the church is in the persecution, in the sin and misery of this world. But this woman uh, isn't, as we said before, just a, an average woman. The moon is under her feet. She has a crown of 12 stars on her head. Well, uh, in Scripture, whenever something is under the feet of somebody, it, it's a picture of dominion. It's, it's a picture of high standing. So, so this woman has the moon under her feet, has the heavenly bodies under her feet. She is wearing a crown. While well, crowns are worn by kings, crowns are worn by rulers. And so what we have is this woman who represents the church, who is in a position of ex exaltation, who, is, who has been given the position of dominion, a, a picture of the church which is glorious, a, church of a, a picture of a church that is meant to rule, but then at the same time you have this woman who is in childbirth, this woman who is in agony, the agony of, of childbirth. So it's not that the church is without her trouble. She has been established, she is represented, but she is in the agony of, of childbirth. Let's hold on to that thought of that first symbol because the second symbol is going to have some conflict with the first symbol. So, so let's understand the second sign now, the second sign in verse 3. Another sign appears in heaven, a great red dragon. So the second sign is also a singular object with some, some other characters that surround him. And, and, the, and the singular object of the second sign is the red dragon. A terrifying dragon. In verse 4, it says this dragon is, is wanting to devour the child that the woman is about to give birth. Uh, two. And so uh, this sign is much easier to understand. The first one was, was maybe challenging. The second one is much easier because this sign is very plainly defined for us in the book of Revelation only a few verses later. So if you look in verse 9, it says the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. So, so that, that's pretty simple. No more questions asked. The, the red dragon is the devil. The red dragon is, is Satan. And so that means that the woman, the church on earth, and the dragon, uh, which represents the enemies of God, are at odds. Now remember where we started, Genesis 3.15. There are two groups of people, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and they are at enmity with each other. And so you have the whole course of human history defined and described in the establishment of these two signs. The seed of the woman, the woman and her son, the seed of the serpent, the red dragon, who is at enmity uh, with this woman. And so in the rest of our text, we see lots of interaction between these two symbols. And so that's what we want to look at next. We want to see the malice of the dragon, especially in verses 4 and 5. And so what we have in our text is this description of this horrible enmity that exists in human history. Now, uh, this dragon against this woman. Now, the dragon makes a mess of numerology, right? Numerology is taking the numbers of the Bible and assigning a meaning to them and getting your understanding of Revelation from that assignment of that numeric value. The, the, the dragon makes a mess of it. Maybe you've heard this when you've heard Bible teachers talk about the number seven. The number seven is the number of perfection, right? And, and the number 10, also the number of perfection. The problem with, for numerologists is that the dragon has both of those numbers. The dragon has seven heads, and he has 10 horns, and he has, he has these crowns uh, on his head. What is the text saying? 
Do we get our understanding by, understand, by, by knowing this number seven? Is the text saying that the dragon is perfect? You might say, is the text saying that the dragon is perfect in his wickedness? It's possible. But what's an easier explanation? An easier explanation is that this dragon is grotesque. An easier explanation is that this dragon is terrifying. He is intimidating. He sweeps with his tail a third of the stars of heaven and and throws them down to the ground. Now remember, we're in prophecy. So we don't need to calculate how many stars are left in the sky because when the fourth trumpet was blown, already a third of the stars were gone. This is not a linear historical textbook. This is a description of the might and power and terror that the dragon brings on the earth. So so it's a way of describing the apparent power of the evil one, the strength, the apparent strength of the devil. And so when we see this red dragon fighting against this woman, we see the dragon living out the enmity that exists between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The dragon carries himself with with great malice, the kind of malice that you see in nature. Nature is a brutal place. The relationship between the predator and the prey is brutal, and there is no mercy in nature. The red dragon has that kind of brutality about him. No mercy, no quarter, only enmity, only destruction, and the sooner the better. And so this woman, she's in the agony of uh, childbearing. She's in active labor, uh, as we call it. And the dragon is waiting for the child to be born so that he can consume it, so that he can eat that child. Well, that's the destructive desire of the devil. Uh, There are times, of course, when the church is lulled into a sense of sleepiness about the destructive desire of the devil, his desire to sow destruction among the saints. But 1 Peter 5, verse 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion doing what? Seeking someone to devour. That's how the devil operates. He loves nothing more than the destruction of certain people. Now, whose destruction is he seeking here in this text? Uh, In verse uh, 4, it talks about how uh, the woman is about to give birth. Verse 5, it's defined as a male child. That's the one that the devil wants to consume. He's waiting for that male child to be born. Now, who is the male child? That, of course, is the next question. So we have the church is the woman. We have the red dragon is the devil. Who is this male child to whom the church gives birth? Well, it's not as difficult as it may seem because you can see this description of this male child. She gives birth to to a male child in verse 5. One who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Well, that takes us back to Psalm 2. Psalm 2, verses 7 through 9, where God is describing what the Messiah will do. What, who, we know him as Jesus Christ. What will he do? He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. This is language that is reserved for the Son of God. If you have uh, more questions about that, you can even turn back to chapter 2 in Revelation and in verse 27, where Christ himself uh, is talking is describing himself and talking about himself as the one who will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. This is Christ, and and there is no other way to see it than to see it as Christ. So so the male child that the red dragon is seeking to destroy is the Messiah. Now the temptation is many fold. How can the church give birth to Christ? We'll deal with that in a minute. But the temptation is to think of this action of the devil as strictly a New Testament problem. 
that since Christ was born, that, that the devil has sought to destroy him. Uh, so you go back to maybe Matthew 4 and the temptations in the wilderness, and, and you see how the devil wanted to, to destroy Christ by having him fall into temptation in, in the wilderness. But it's not just a New Testament problem. You could think about Herod destroying the, the babies in, in, in Bethlehem, how, how that would be an attempt in the New Testament of the devil to devour the child as it's described here. No, this is a Bible problem. This is a biblical relationship that has existed from the beginning of the fall until even today where where the devil is seeking to devour the male child. You can see it in in Abraham and the oppression that he faced. Jacob, when uh, when he was when his brother Esau came out to meet him, Israel and the enemies that lived all around him, David when he was being supplanted by his own son Absalom or being chased around in the wilderness by his father-in-law Saul, all the way through to Herod in Bethlehem when he, when he kills all the young boys in that town. All of that is an attempt by the red dragon to eat and devour the male child. He is seeking to snuff out the line of promise. His whole MO, his whole purpose from the time of the fall until uh, the the time of Christ's death and resurrection was to remove Christ and to to eliminate Christ and to, to have the promised Messiah be destroyed. So, that's one thing. We, we see it as a relationship that has existed from Genesis 3.15 on. But then you also have that other question that we raised before. How can the church give birth to Christ? If, if the woman is the, the church and the, the red dragon is the devil, and how can the male child be Christ? How can the church give birth to Christ? Well, the identification isn't really that problematic because this is, again, a symbol, and the symbol that is given to us of this Messiah, all the way back in Genesis 3.15, again, is the seed of the woman. The Christ is the messianic seed of the woman. The, the Christ comes from the woman, not that the church produces the Messiah, but that God, through the church and through the line of David, brings this Messiah into the world. He is not literally born of the church. He is simply the messianic seed of the church. And so the dragon's malice towards that child is seen throughout all of the Old Testament, seen throughout all the Gospels. It is warfare against the Christ. Warfare against the one who will reverse the effects of sin. And this is the experience of the church. Uh, To live in that day when the dragon seeks to destroy the Messiah uh, in order that he would have the victory. So so we don't see the full victory of Christ over and against the the dragon until the end of chapter 14. But we do want to gain some encouragement as we look at the first six verses. There are some things, some benefits that are plainly presented to us even in these opening verses that show God's provision to the church, that show his protection over and against his people. And so that's what we want to look at next. We want to see the provision and protection of God. What's amazing is that you have this great, terrifying dragon, but in the midst of that, the woman and the child are protected. And so we can can look at four different things uh, that God does even in these opening verses Two of them deal with the way that he protects the Messiah, that he protects Christ. Two of them deals with, deal with how he uh, provides for his people. So let's think first about how God protects his Christ. It says in verse 5 that she gives birth to a male child, but that the child is caught up to God and to his throne. Now, we have to be careful because we're not saying that God the Son is in need of a bodyguard that he is somehow not powerful enough to take care of himself. This is plainly describing when the Son of God took on human flesh, how he walked when he was on the earth. Uh, In his divine nature, he's omnipotent, meaning he's all-powerful. There's no rival for him. 
But there is that time when Christ walks on the earth when he is a man like every other man who is weak and, and not omnipotent. In his human nature, he's not omnipotent. So, so Christ on earth at times is protected. You can see that in, in a place like John 7 and verse 30. It says the Jew, about the Jews, they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour, uh, his hour had not yet come. So however much the dragon would like to eliminate uh, this Messiah, he was protected. Uh, the, the, his enemies couldn't lay a hand on him because his time had not yet come. He has the protection of the Father over him. Whatever the dragon's plan may be, he cannot carry it out without divine approval. And so when it comes to the protection of the male child, even when it comes to his ascension into heaven, as I think it is talking about that here in, in verse 5, even in all of that, all of that takes place according to God's own good timing. Uh, Romans 5, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And so God preserved, God protected, uh, God sent his son at that right time. And so through that provision, even when the dragon thought he won, he actually had defeated himself by having Christ hung on the cross. So we see God's protection of Christ in the protection of the male child, how he doesn't let the dragon devour him. You also see it in Christ's ascension uh, at the right hand of the Father. When, when Christ ascends to heaven, when Christ is seated at God's right hand, that's a significant point, and you see that described here in this text. The child is caught up to God and to his throne. His ascension means that his work on earth is done. His session or his being seated at the right hand is a guarantee that Christ will bring us to himself. You see, when Christ ascends and when Christ is seated at the right hand of God, that is Christ in his human nature. Our high priest with our flesh has already experienced the resurrection that we covet and he is at the right hand. He is the, the first fruits of those who are raised. What does it mean to be the first fruits? It means that the rest of the fruits are going to follow. The harvest is begun with the first fruits. The rest of the harvest will follow. And so it is with Christ. There we have the protection of, of Christ, the, the finality of his work, so that his final work will be accomplished, that, that he will be ascended. He has ascended. And he will be seated. He is seated. All of those things have taken place because of God's protection over the Son in his human nature. But then there's also the provisions that God gives to his people, the provision that God gives to his church today. And that's seen in two different ways. You see it, first of all, in the limit of time that God gives to the affliction of the church. So in verse 6, right at the end, it says that the church is nourished for 1,260 days. Well, since things happen according to God's timing... Uh, there's no point in complaining against our suffering. Uh, if we are in Christ, our suffering is for our good. And even the suffering that we face in our text is shown to be temporary. Uh, we, we saw this number, 1,260, before in chapter 11, in verse 3, uh, where it talked about the two witnesses who were able to prophesy for 1,260 Days. We also saw that number actually in verse, in verse 2 of chapter 11 when it said, talks about the 42 months. That's the same number, just expressed in a different way. And so when it comes to this church which has to flee into the wilderness to be kept from being devoured by the dragon, this takes place for 1,260 days. The number of days is not the point. What is the point is that it's a limited period of time. The, ch the church's time in the wilderness is limited. It doesn't last forever. And so when the church endures difficulty, the church can do that with the knowledge that it is temporary. The difficulty will not last forever. So there's a limit to the time. That's God's provision for his people. There's another way that God provides for his people in the things that he supplies. So in verse 6, it says, the woman flees into the wilderness 
where she has a place prepared by God in which she is nourished. So God prepares the place and God nourishes. Uh, those are the things that are true of the church. True of the church in the wilderness. The church of John's day is in the wilderness. They're, they're under the persecution of the world. The, the dragon is seeking to devour the male child and by extension, the church itself. And, and so in that, in that wilderness, God is preparing a place. God is nourishing his church. There are so many different examples where you see Israel, the church in the wilderness, where they are provided and supplied uh, by God. You can think of David on the run from Saul. He spent so many years in the wilderness and he never lacked anything. In fact, he accumulated around himself an army, an army that was willing to go to the well at Bethlehem to get him some water to drink. Or you could think of uh, the prophet Elijah after prophesying, being sent into the wilderness and being fed by God uh, by the ravens. It's that kind of thing, except on a much larger scale. When the church endures hardship, God provides for his people. We don't always know the reason why God asks his church to suffer, why God asks his church to endure tribulation, but when he does, he doesn't abandon them. When he does, he, he provides for them both the place in the wilderness and the nourishment within uh, the wilderness. Another great example is Israel in the wilderness, right? When God gives manna and water from the rock, it's God's provision for his people. And so you have this dragon, which is at enmity with the woman. And then you have the, God, the plan of God with regarding this seed of the woman being carried out according to his plan. Christ's work can never be thwarted. And Christ's people are protected from this dragon. This is the blessing that the New Testament church experiences from reading this text. Remember, chapter 1 and verse 3, blessed are those who read aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written, written in them for the time is at hand. Here is the blessing that God preserves his people. Circumstances notwithstanding, God preserves his people. And that's what I want us to appropriate as his people today as our application to think properly about how God takes care of his church. We need to hear that today as well. God didn't write Revelation, the book of Revelation for the church in, in the, at the end of the first century, right? Because they were struggling with, with weakness and, and they were struggling with a, a lack of confidence about God's work among his church. We experience that today as well. Isn't that right? Aren't there lots of reasons for us to get anxious about the church? There are many reasons. There are social pressures, pressures from society that, that make us worry about the church. We worry about how, uh, how, how our culture is turning against the church and, and growing hostile against the church. Uh, in our own time, that's been, that's been accelerated in some sense by in some places where you have in in, uh, in Canada, our northern neighbors, or in California, attempts by the civil magistrate to close the church of Christ. In some places, maybe you've seen the picture of the civil magistrate erecting a temporary fence around the church so, so that the church can't meet. Or maybe you don't have to think about the implications of COVID. You can simply think about our persecuted brothers and sisters, our our brothers and sisters in places like China where, where pastors are arrested and sentenced to prison for years, close to a decade. You can think of uh, Pastor Wang Yi of the Early Rain Church. And, and we say to ourselves, how is the church going to make it? How is the church going to overcome? Well, here's the blessing of this text. The church doesn't need to overcome. The church doesn't need to, to overcome. The church needs to be the church, and God will overcome. That's the comfort of the Christian. That's the comfort of the church. Nothing will prevail against the church. The church may suffer. The church may be in the wilderness. The church may have a great red dragon that is seeking to devour it, but nothing will prevail against the church. The, 
that's because preservation of the church doesn't come from man. It doesn't come from any one person or any one group of people. Preservation from the church comes from the Lord. And the Lord, I hope this doesn't surprise you, is more powerful than any civil magistrate. The Lord is more powerful than, than any disease. The, the Lord is more powerful than any red dragon. The Lord is more powerful, and so the call for the church is simply to be faithful. Be faithful while you're being nourished in the wilderness. Be faithful in the place within the wilderness that God has set apart for you. Simply be faithful. We don't need to begin wringing our hands because society is pressuring one way or the other. We simply must do the work of the church. Another reason why we might worry about the church is because of corruption within the church. And we act as if in our own time we're facing some unique problem and we encounter immorality or heresy within the church. And it's not the case. There, there are always going to be unfaithful men who arise in the church. The Lord himself made that very plain in different places. One of them is the parable of the weeds among the wheat. And it is true, there are things that the church does to, to accelerate and to cause a corruption to, to, to grow. Uh, when the church neglects the means of grace, what I mean by that is when the church fails to proclaim the word, when the church fails to administer the sacraments, when the church fails to come together in prayer, then it's not surprising that, that, that we produce weak leaders, weak Pastors, those who don't know the truth of God's word. And that, of course, is the warning of the apostle to the church in 2 Timothy 4.3. The time is coming, he says there, when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Well, is that now? That's what we say to ourselves. We're wringing our hands about, is that now? Is, is, is this the time when, when everything is falling apart? Maybe it is. More likely, it's always been that way. It's always been that way. The church is always at various degrees of purity. The church has never been perfect. Is it possible that in our day, many churches will become the synagogue of Satan? Yes, that is possible. How do you avert that? A new vision? A new strategy? Who is more powerful than all the little dragons that might want to grow up within the walls of the church? God is more powerful. He will preserve His church. That is His great promise. So the church is preserved. The church is nursed. In our text, who nourishes the church? Who gives the church this special place within the wilderness? God does. It doesn't mean that we don't care about what's going on in society. It doesn't mean that we don't strive for doctrinal purity within the church. It just means that we don't despair over it. We don't begin wringing our hands over it. We, we do what is faithful because God is over His people. And that's true within the church setting but it also might be true in our personal lives. The, the rejection that we experience maybe in our personal ministries, whether it be a formal ministry as a pastor, as an elder, as a deacon, maybe as a, a street preacher or an evangelist, or even in our personal relationships within our home. Discouragement can tempt us to throw up our hands and say, it's, it's all no use. The dragon is too strong. The dragon is too too much for me. I, I'm in this wilderness all by myself, and there's no hope for me. Maybe you feel that way when your family begins to despise you, or, or maybe you feel that way when the people who, who should support you become the greatest source of discouragement for you. All of that feels like a wilderness. But within that wilderness, people of God, don't we learn that there's a place prepared for us? Don't we learn that 
that there is nourishment for God's people in this wilderness, that, that he is the one who's taking care of them in that place? See, people of God, the Lord has prepared a place for his bride. And he loves his people far more than you can imagine. He loves his people far more than you do. And he will not let any of his people fall. In the final sense of things, the Lord nourishes his people. And so there is a a thing to be protected. The church is to be protected. But God preserves his church. And what does it say in Matthew 16? It says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, that's the flow of history. That's the flow of everything that's happened since Genesis 3.15 and onward. The seed of the serpent has sought to devour the seed of the woman, and he cannot because God is preventing it. At the very moment when the devil thought he was most successful, maybe laughing in his evil delight at seeing the Messiah nailed to the cross and breathing his last and crying out about how God had forsaken him. When the devil was rubbing his hands with delight, it was at that very moment that God brought salvation for all his people. That was the sacrifice that was necessary. When the red dragon was rejoicing over the death of Christ, he had actually sealed his own defeat. And every time we begin thinking that it's up to us, and every time we think we have to do it just a little bit better so that we can have success, we are forgetting that it is God's work of redemption and not ours. It's not that we do not labor in his kingdom. But we labor as subjects. We labor as citizens. We labor under our king. And so we must never forget that the king rules, that the king protects his kingdom. And the great blessing for all of God's people is the knowledge that against this king, not a single foe can stand. Let's pray together.